Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jagley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Amazon Music, Ghana, Spotify, Apple, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Peter Solomon. He is here to celebrate the Stardust Mystery. Before we begin our celebration of the Stardust Mysteries, we want you to join us for an amazing celebration, reading in the new year. That's right, we are saying goodbye to 2020 and saying hello to all the wonderful, joyous moments that we are going to get to spend together in 2021. Reading in the new year, this is our virtual family literacy fair that can be found at readinginthenewyear.com. It all starts Christmas morning, December 25th, and runs until January 1st, 2021. We are so excited. We have authors from all around the world joining this amazing celebration. Check this out. We are building three virtual stages where you'll be able to see authors reading their books, uh, performances, and also do-it-together activities. There's also a ton of downloadable, free downloadable activities that you can do with your family to provide hours of offline fun. Check it out. This is just some of the authors who will be joining us. Dina Sherman, Jen Ulu, Andrew Katz, um, Angie Flores, Stacey Ramey, Jordan Scavone, Helen Wu, uh, uh, Eliana Melman, Taryn Shipman. So many amazing authors. I'll be performing magic, some vintage magic performed by my kids. There's so much happening. You don't want to miss it. Go to readinginthenewyear.com right now. Bookmark the page and get ready to go back when everything goes live on Christmas morning. Readinginthenewyear.com Join us right now from the Hartford area in the great state of Connecticut. He is the author of the Stardust Mystery. Please welcome to the show Peter Solomon. Peter, how are you? I am good. Uh, Hanging in there and enjoying the last of the good weather. Yeah, yeah, here in New England. We're not all that far away from each other here in New England. It's so crazy we had... In Boston, we had uh, a snow on uh, Halloween Eve, and then three days later, it was in the 70s. It was yeah. It's just mind-boggling sometimes. So you you just have to enjoy it when it comes. Exactly, exactly. And you know, kind of solving the the mystery of New England weather. Um, I, I think solving the, the you know the the the, the question of, of how did the, how did the universe get created. It would be easier than trying to figure out New England weather, I think. <laughs> yeah, the old saying, if you don't like the weather in New England, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Well, I can't wait uh, to learn more about the Stardust Mystery. Tell us about this book, please. Well, um, it is a book that is intended to provide young people of uh, age uh, 8 to 13 with a really enjoyable and entertaining story that they can relate to, where as they get involved in the story, they are going to learn a lot of science, a lot of real science. Um, the, The theme of the Stardust Mystery is we are made of stardust, that was once in the body of Albert Einstein and the last T-Rex. That is scientifically true. We each have something like 5,000 carbon atoms that were once in one single T-Rex that are in our bodies. And we've got like 300 trillion that were once in Albert Einstein. Now, how how does that work? I, I, I... I didn't have a chance to read the Stardust Mysteries when I was a kid, so I, I don't get how do I have 
carbon that was once in a T-Rex inside of me? Well, the, the mechanism of transport is the following. You have carbon atoms in your body uh, that are um, there because of the food you eat ah. and are there as sugars. And uh, when you produce a podcast, you have to use that energy. Uh, you have to burn those carbon atoms. And so you burn them and you exhale them as carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is then absorbed by plants. And those plants could be, for example, an apple tree. And it, the carbon is used to grow apples. And so every time I chomp on an apple and take a bite, uh, I am eating carbon atoms that were once in a T-Rex and once in Albert Einstein. That, you, you know, you just explained it in a way that my simple mind can, can put my hand <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'll be honest, you know, I'm the co-host of a, a podcast called Solve It For Kids. We just interviewed um, a, 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 a pioneering organic chemist who talked a little bit about na nanotechnology and and. and carbon atoms and all that kind of stuff and she was wonderful but there's still a lot that just kind of zoomed right <laughs> over my head <laughs> well since I'm trying to write a book that could be understood by an 8 year old I, I've tried to put those things and I've by spending 5 years on writing this book I've gotten used to uh, being able to talk about these scientific concepts in a uh, a manner that is uh, understandable. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the amazing thing is the number of carbon atoms, five thousand trillion carbon atoms that were once in the T Rex, and that is because of the amazingly huge number of carbon atoms that are in your body. There are more carbon atoms in your body than there are stars in the universe. There are 10 with 27 zeros after it as the number of carbon atoms in your body. In my body. And then. In your. Yeah. And, and, and so there's 350 million bodies here or so in the United States. And then. Uh, you know, I don't know, six or seven billion around the world. And then there's carbon atoms in plants and animals and all. That's a lot of carbon atoms. And that number is 10 followed by 42 zeros. <laughs> and that is the fixed number of carbon atoms that are on Earth. And so they are constantly being repurposed, reused, transferred from one body into uh, a plant and then into another body. And then, of course, a lot of carbon is in, a huge amount of the carbon is in the oceans mm -hmm. in the form of absorbed carbon dioxide. A huge amount is in the soils, uh, but there's enough of it that's in the atmosphere and in plants and animals that gets transferred back and forth uh, to you and me and and, and have come from all of those living beings before us. So if I'm hearing you right, that carbon doesn't disappear or dissipate or get destroyed. It just gets reused and recycled. Right. Um, in the book, the, the girls, uh, by the way, this is a wonderful, wonderful science story for girls. The, um, of the four main characters, three of them are girls and they do absolutely their fair share of learning the science. So it's a good uh, inspiration for girls. And the book is told by uh, the four, four main characters, the one boy and three girls. They're, they're two sisters and the other two are cousins. Mm. Um, and so a lot of the interesting story that the kids are going to like is the the kids' lives and their interactions and their sibling rivalries and their jealousies and their 
all their interactions. Uh, it was kind of funny. Um, I was writing something about the book uh, for one of the websites, and I said that the four characters are based on on my grandchildren. I've got 12 grandchildren. And so what a wonderful use of grandchildren to use them as the the as the basis for your characters. And I, I said that, that Lizzie in the story really does know how to do the double flying martial arts, arts kick. She, <laughs> she's got a, a double black belt in martial arts. Wow. And, and Milo really did have this enormous speak, uh, sneaker collection. And in the book, the two of them are constantly competing. They're in the same grade, and they're constantly competing to see who could be the best one with the best grades. But in the description, I kind of left that out. I figured that was kind of <laughs> silly. But then we had lunch with our granddaughter outside at one of the local restaurants here about two weeks ago. And the, and she, uh, Lizzie and Milo are now in college, not their real names, right? But they're now uh, sophomores in college. And she says to me, "Oh, and my grade point average is, is higher than Milo." <laughs> <laughs> so they are still competing. Well, so you know that's what. The, like, that's the story part that the kids could get interested in. And the other is the tension. They're a team competing in a contest. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's all the story part that the kids can, can love. And they have a technology um, called the Cosmic Egg that allows them to travel anywhere in the universe at any time in the universe and actually talk to anyone who's there. And... So the story part is a fascinating time travel and adventure, but then all of the science that they learn about the atoms and what are, what kinds of atoms and how big are they and how, how big are they and how many are they and how are they arranged and where were they produced and how are they produced? Uh, all of that is real science. Mm. And so putting the science into a story that can get the interest of kids in reading the story for the social content, but also for the investigation content, uh, I think is the best way for kids to learn about science. Well, you know, I agree with you. Um, being, uh, you know, somebody that, that, that does educational magic shows, I understand the, that we... There are a lot of kids out there. Are a lot of kids out there who are just they love science, and they can sit down with that chemist that I was speaking about and understand everything that she's saying and enjoy the way it's presented. Um, but there are other kids who are, you know, they're on the fence and they have all this technology, they have all these things competing for their attention, and you know they're not going to be as open and enthusiastic to a. a you know, a science lesson in school. But if we can open up their, their, their brains, get them entertained, get those endorphins firing in their minds so that suddenly it's like, I, it, it's not that I have to read this book, it's that I want to read this book. I think Absolutely. That's the way to really, especially those kids that are on the fence, that, you know, don't have that natural yep. desire to learn a, this, this type of content. And... um one of the interesting things happened at the very beginning of the book when <clears throat> I had young children review it and they, <clears throat> they learned about, about our time and space travel machine. And they said, well, we really like the book, but could you make us that machine? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that, um, inspired me to write a, a, uh, proposal to the National Science Foundation. Uh, which got funded. We, uh, we got a, a phase one and a phase two and an intermediate phase with funding of over a million dollars. And with that, we created the companions to the book, which are videos, video games where the kids can travel back to the 
dinosaur era and investigate how many carbon atoms they got from each of the dinosaurs. Uh, we have excerpted the book in short stories, and we've created uh, student projects that are on our website, and then we've created lesson plans for teachers and parents who want to make this learning this story kind of a either a class project or a family project. Yeah. I love what what inspired because this is a massive undertaking with a story and and videos yeah. and and lessons and and just writing a grant can you know can can consume someone. What inspired you to take this challenge on? Um, well, I had always been interested in writing uh, a book. I have. I'm a scientist, a physicist with a long career uh, in doing science and writing uh, technical papers for scientific journals. So I've got done a lot of writing, but I've always wanted to write a book, a, uh, a fictional story. And I, but I never really uh, came up with the story that inspired me. Oh, that's the story. That's the what, that's what I'm going to write about. And then my 12th grandchild was born. And I said, ah, I've got it. I love science. I don't like the way they teach science facts in school. Science should be taught with wonderful stories. And there are so many wonderful stories in science. I'm going to write a book that brings one of those wonderful stories, the Stardust Mystery, to children. Ah. And so that's where it all came from. I, I love that. The, you're right. You know, a lot of science, all, a lot of the STEM you know, subjects are taught through facts. Yes. And just, you know, uh, with a teacher up at the t at the head of the classroom, you know, just reciting facts. And, and the goal for kids is to memorize it and regurgitate it instead of really instilling it and understanding it. And throughout history, that's not the way human beings learned. It's, you know, that whole, uh, I you know, presenting facts is a really recent thing. Human beings have learned through story forever yep. yeah I, I was just speaking to to another guest we seem you know to to do something in one way in one direction for a long time and then someone says you know the way we're doing this it's not perfect we need a change and instead of making a little tweak or a twerk and slight correction we decide oh we're going to go in this completely opposite direction over here what do you think? What would happen where where people sat down and said, "Okay, yeah, we used to learn in stories, but that's we're not going to do that anymore. We're just going to sit kids down and give them this information. They're going to have to memorize it." Well, that comes from the way the scientists do their discoveries. I mean, it is a piece by piece by piece by piece discovery. We uh, typically. Uh, you know, we don't, we're not Albert Einstein and we don't have this grand vision of relativity, which changes the whole perspective. Um, or, uh, I mean, the wonderful story of the Big Bang, uh, which, by the way, part of that was facilitated, again, going back to girls in science. There is a woman called Henrietta Levitt who made a huge, huge constant contribution to science and who nobody recognizes or hardly anyone recognizes. She was so obscure that when they finally decided her work was so fantastic they were going to give her a Nobel Prize, they discovered she'd been dead for three years. <laughs> nobody knew that. But she was the one who figured out how to actually measure the distance to stars and then discovered that we weren't just the Milky Way. That was just one galaxy. But we were uh, galaxies upon galaxies with stars way, way outside the Milky Way. 
And then Edwin Hubble discovered those stars were moving away from us. And then Georges Lemaitre uh, solved Einstein's equations and said, well, the most reasonable solution to Einstein's equations is that it all started in a little tiny cosmic egg that exploded into this universe that is expanding. What a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and yet we don't teach that. We, we have the star, to, we have the Big Bang Theory on television, yeah, which but... <laughs> presents a completely ridiculous of <laughs> image of what scientists are like. But that wonderful story, which is in the book, mm -hmm. um, is a wonderful story for kids. And, and the story is that this, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and helium, the tiniest atoms, but that's all it produced. And then we had to wait until the first stars formed and exploded before we got the bigger atoms that make up our body. Mm -hmm. And then we had to wait even longer uh, for older stars, more mature stars to explode to get uranium and gold and things like that. And there was a fascinating discovery. Um, Einstein said, Einstein predicted gravitational waves. These are waves where the actual fabric of space is stretching back and forth and back and forth. Uh, said we'd never be able to measure that. Well, uh, a good friend of mine uh, was part of the this National Science Foundation LIGO project that actually succeeded in making a measurement of a fraction of a proton change in space over kilometer distances. And they actually... <coughs> measured uh, gravitational waves. Wow. And yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and in 2017, they measured a, a, a gravitational wave from an event that they, putting all the facts together and other measurements together, they said was the merger of two neutron stars. Those two neutron stars produced gravitational waves, but they were also one of the major producers of all the heavy atoms in the universe. Not that particular event, but all of the other neutron star mergers. And they said that that one event produced more gold in that one event than the weight of the, of the Earth. You have so much energy, and you're so excited as you're telling this story. And it's impossible not to listen and be interested as you're telling these stories. And and one of the things that, that you mentioned earlier on is that on your website, you have all these different resources for teachers and, and, and maybe for, and I think you said maybe for parents. And, and grandparents. And grandparents. And, and this is, you know, I think a lot of parents and grandparents, they get intimidated they think i'm i'm not a science guy i don't know this this kind of stuff but this is a way to explore with your kids together do the right. exploration together and yep. uh i i think that's a great way to learn to it's together you don't have to be an expert to help your kids learn to help them navigate through yep. the stem fields it's hey take my hand we're going to walk through this together and they could do it remotely, mm -hmm. and they could do it over Zoom. Yep. Um, and see each other's expressions. And okay, you know, we just finished reading the first three chapters. What, what did we find out? Uh, and who, which character do you like best? And so, yeah, it is a really good way for uh, parents and grandparents to do that. It's a good way for teachers too. Yep. And the lesson uh, plans. Uh, there are, uh, on our kids page, there are seven kids who have their own page. Each one tells a different part of a story. And then, uh, there's a kids project page where 
uh, it would be ideal for seven kids. Each one becomes an expert on each of the part of the each part of the story, and then they get together and write up. <clears throat> um, where did stardust come from? Yeah. Uh, what is the carbon cycle like? Um, they get together and write up the, their report uh, as a team uh, of ideally seven kids, but could be done with fewer kids as well. Yeah. So much going on, and, and we're really excited. And I think we could talk for, for hours, but I, I, I have one question, though. Now, you said that the, that the the four characters in the book are based on your grandkids, but you also told us you had 12 grandkids. The other eight grandkids waiting for you to write books featuring them? <laughs> well, um, not the older one, <laughs> but I got a call. I sent out a copy of the book to the two youngest. One is seven. One is nine or ten. And I got a call from the ten-year-old who saw that the seven-year-old was in the book Uh. and said, (laughs) Grandpa, could you at least put me in the next book? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm glad that he did because that means that there's a better chance that we'll have a second book and have a second chance for you to come back. Eleven chapters have been written. Um... I'm, uh, I put it aside for a while because I have to try to do the marketing for this book mm-hmm. to try to let parents and grandparents and teachers know all about it. Yeah. Um, I am getting a lot of uh, pickup from uh, librarians, school librarians. They are picking it up. We're offering the PDF copy of the book free uh, during this month. Oh, and that- so they have been requesting it. Excellent. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, but I'm about done with the marketing. I don't like marketing. <laughs> <laughs> when well, you write a book, you write a chapter, you can see what you've done. Marketing, ah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're, we would be very remiss in our marketing of the book if we didn't tell folks where they can go to find out more about the book. Because your, your website is fantastic. Let everybody know where they can find it, please. Uh, well, the website is... Uh, the stardust mystery.com. This one word, the stardust mystery.com. There is a kids page, a kids project page, an education page, or an educator page, and a parents and grandparents page. The book is, uh, for sale easily, uh, on Barnes and Noble and also on Amazon. So the book can be purchased there. Yeah. Um, and if you and if you have an, a favorite indie bookstore that you want to support, I know you can go there and request the book, and they can get it to you in two or three days. Absolutely, the uh, uh, the printer is Ingram, uh, and they will they supply all of the bookstores, and they, of course they supply Amazon and and Barnes and Noble as well. Yeah, hey, we've had a fascinating and fun time. Speaking uh, about making STEM fun for kids by speaking to the author of The Stardust Mystery, Peter Solomon. Peter, thanks so much for being part of the show. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. I enjoyed it a lot. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest would be Ellen Hopkins. She'll be here to celebrate her middle grade novel, In Verse, Closer to Nowhere. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Be sure to check out readinginthenewyear.com. Be part of our free virtual family literacy fair. It's all happening starting Christmas morning and running through New Year's Day. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Dr. Peter Solomon. Be sure to check out the Stardust Mystery. I also want to thank my team, Alejandro Doherty, Fatima Khan. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.